Welcome to Austin Faith Dialogue. I'm Carl Gronberg, host for the program, and we thank you for joining us. Today on Austin Faith Dialogue, we're going to talk about compassion and how compassion is lived out within our community of Austin and around the world. I know you'll want to meet the people I have on the program, so please stay with us today on Austin Faith Dialogue. Austin Faith Dialogue at the crossroads of religion and life, a series highlighting the cultural and social interactions between the worshiping and religious communities in and around the capital city. Austin Faith Dialogue is brought to you by the Austin Metropolitan Ministries in cooperation with KXAN. Join us now in Austin Faith Dialogue. As we begin Austin Faith Dialogue today, I want to share with you these words from a person of faith. Every human being has a great yet often unknown gift to care, to be compassionate, to become present to the other, to listen, to hear, and to receive. If that gift would be set free and made available, miracles could take place. Henry Nouwen knew something about compassion and sharing compassion and the miracles that take place in people's lives when they set free that wondrous gift of God. Roseanne Becker is with us today from Interfaith Care Alliance and Roger Temme. And they're going to talk about compassion that takes place within this great community of Austin, Texas. Roseanne, welcome to Austin Faith Dialogue. And Roger, glad to have you here. Tell our viewing audience about um, Interfaith Care Alliance. Uh, what are you about? Interfaith Care Alliance is a group that enables people to help people in a ministry of compassion. Uh, they train people to serve on care teams. Uh, those care teams then are supporting, encouraging, practically helping, uh, such as grocery shopping and transportation, kinds of practical things. Uh, people who are living with AIDS and HIV and other serious illnesses. Roger, how about you? How did you become a part of Interfaith Alliance? How did you hear about it, and what does it mean to you? So first of all, I'd like to thank you, Carl, for allowing us to spend a few moments with you. Uh, I think we found each other, Interfaith Care Alliance and I, uh, and I was thinking of two things that uh, have happened in my life. I went through my own spiritual and mental illness and it was during that time that a number of people came into my life who I found a real support and caring community. And also, uh, in the last few years, I've known a number of people who have lived and have died with AIDS. And those affected me, but the one that really affected me was my own cousin, Randy, who died a couple of years ago. Uh, and knowing how it touched our family and how impacted we were by his life and his death, uh, it made a real impression upon me. And when recently I, I myself heard of Interfaith Care Alliance and realized they were looking for an outreach coordinator, I, uh, I happened to walk in at the right moment. And I, uh, I feel very blessed to be a part of this, this group and what they're doing for the city of Austin. I find it exciting that the two of you and others like you are involved in this uh, outreach of compassion. Uh, Roger, you shared those words with me from Henry Nouwen. Why do you believe that compassion is an important uh, byproduct of people of faith? Why is it important that people who say they are people of faith, who believe in God, that they show that and demonstrate that in compassion? Well, I understand compassion as, as walking with another person, actually stepping into the other person's shoes and taking on their skin and taking on what their experience of life is, which means both their joys as well as their pains. Uh, I find Interfaith Care Alliance enables people who, who have a desire, a desire that comes from within, from their understanding of who God is for them, their higher power, uh, that somehow they want to step in to the shoes of another person, somebody who is suffering, somebody who is ill, and to be present. Uh, I think if, if I were to use a word presence is what I know our clients, who we call care partners, expect and want, that somebody is, is present and is with them in their time of pain and suffering. To share with them in life and the pilgrimage of life. Roseanne, 
You've done that. You've been a part of Interfaith Care Alliance for a while. You've served in a variety of capacities. You're a board member and other areas. Talk to us about a little bit of the history and how Interfaith Care Alliance does what Roger just outlined, walks with people and shares life with people. Well, Interfaith Care Alliance was first Interact, which was uh, affiliated with Austin Metropolitan Ministries, mm -hmm. and in 1997 became Interfaith Care Alliance with the same board that had served on it previously, but with a different name, mm -hmm. and uh, doing the same kind of work. Uh, the care partners are referred through a an agency such as Aid Services of Austin. Mm -hmm. uh, they, individuals need to indicate that they are ready to accept the help that the care teams are ready to provide. And I served on seven different care teams, uh, leading several of those uh, before I then became a board member. So I've seen it kind of from both sides. And I have to say that Everyone I've known who's been involved in this, in this work really feels that they are given more than they give. Where do these care teams come from? How do people become a part of a care team? Matter of fact, you're there and the viewing audience is watching and they're saying, well, that sounds interesting to me. I'd like to be a part of this. I'd like to live that type of compassion. How do they become a part of a care team? You mentioned that the care partners can be referred to you, but how, how does one become a part of a care team? I think oftentimes people hear about us through their local uh, affiliation, their religious denomination. Uh, we, I as outreach coordinator, go out to the different denominations and in fact invite people to come as volunteers to, uh, to spend some time in training, preparing to, to walk with their care partner. Uh, I think it comes from people's expressions of their understanding of God's love for them. So oftentimes we, we find them in a variety of houses of worship mm -hmm. around Austin. Uh, that's where we find them and they oftentimes find us. But Roger, I can imagine people saying, I think that's great work. I think people of compassion need to be doing that. But I'm not qualified to do that. I don't know how to do that. How do I become trained? What's the process of being trained? If a person has that willingness, and hears from their community of faith, their worship leader about it, then what's the process of being trained? Roseanne? You use the magic word, willingness. Ah, good. Uh, I've, <laughs> had, I've had the privilege to be a part of the training process, which is done quarterly. The training is offered quarterly. And the one point I want people to remember in the training is that the qualification of being a part of this is one's willingness to do it. It's my personal faith belief that the ability will be provided from the one that led you to the training. That's kind of what Henry Nowen was saying in that piece, Roger, you gave me and that mm -hmm. I read, is that this uh, set free, that element of mm -hmm. and caring that's in, in every human being. I think mm -hmm. it's people's willingness to step out, step mm -hmm. out of their own comfortable place. Mm -hmm. uh, because oftentimes we're asking them to, to go into a life of someone they they don't know, and maybe that person's way of living, they don't understand. So we're in fact asking them to step out in faith to, again, as I said earlier, walk in somebody else's shoes, take on their experience of what life is. And we hope that we help them through the, uh, the we do a six hour training, and we hope that we help them through the training to, to answer the kind of concerns or questions they have. And as I've told many people when I've talked to them, when they ask, well, what do we do, uh, basically, you do what you do best. If you're a good cook, you cook. If you're good at taking care of the yard, you do that. If you're good at driving somebody to a, an appointment, do that. If you're good at listening, just sitting with somebody, after someone might invite them to pray, to pray with them. Uh, the gifts are basically what we all have within us to do. What if you're good at making a quilt? Is that a possibility? That is certainly is. I think we have a quilt that we're gonna show to our viewing audience. And when we show this quilt, I want you to be able, Roseanne, to tell us a little bit about the person uh, in memory of mm -hmm. that the quilt was made. So as our viewing audience watches this tape, here is the quilt. Tell us about it, would you please? Well, this was really a piece of grief work that one care team that I had privileged to be a part of did to remember 
our care partner. TJ was a very incredibly unusual person, but then most of the people that we serve are. Uh, we really wanted to remember him and convey through the quilt the different aspects of his life that were important to him. He was into theater. He did exotic floral designs. Uh, but the rainbow on the quilt has several sayings that we most associated with him. And one of those, it's probably difficult to, to see on the screen, but one of them says, without AIDS, I would never have known unconditional mm -hmm. love. And I feel that's the real task of a care team, not to convert, not to proselytize, but to convey unconditional love of the individual because that individual may have actually received hurtful messages from congregations, uh, groups in the name of the church. Uh, so it's our job simply to accept them as a person, regardless of whether we understand or agree with their lifestyle or, or individual choices they've made, mm. but to convey that unconditional love, which hey, is very freeing. Can it be said any better than what Rosanna's already said? Is there any better way of saying what it's all about? I think the unconditional love is what we're all about. However a person understands God in their life and however they have been loved and cared for and supported, that's what we're asking them also to now turn to another and reach out and support them. You're incredible people and you're a part of the Austin community. Rosanne, what is this interfaith care alliance meant to you? Well, it's, it's been an incredible, incredible journey. Uh, one of the things that I also share in the training is that each individual care partner is going to be a brand new experience because it's a brand new person and people are very different. So it's never dull. It's very exciting. It's very humbling. It's an opportunity to spend time living in someone's life while they're living. Uh, and the emphasis is on the living rather than the dying. being present with them is exactly. what uh, Nowen said, and that's what you're saying. Exactly. Roger, we're going to put up on the screen uh, how people can reach you. Maybe you can tell them a little bit more about the ways they can uh, become involved in Interfaith Care Alliance as your name and phone number uh, are put up on the screen. Well, one of pra practical way is we're having our training coming up in September, September 7th and 9th uh, at St. Stephen's Missionary Baptist Church. Uh, if people are interested in, in coming to that training and being a part of it, or even just wanting more information about who we are, we invite them to call us. And uh, we'll be happy to uh, share with them uh, the love and the care that we have felt from those who have loved us. Roger Timmy, thank you. Roseanne Becker, thank you. We're glad you're a part of Austin, and we thank you for your compassion. Stay with us on Austin Faith Dialogue as we continue to discuss compassion in our lives. Welcome back to Austin Faith Dialogue. We're talking about compassion. and We talked about compassion here in Austin through Interfaith Care Alliance. And now we're going to talk about compassion around the world in Iraq. And Susan Van Heitzma is with us in the program. And she's going to share with us some ideas and thoughts on what we might be able to do to care for people in a nation far away from us, a nation that we've called our enemy but a nation that has people, and children particularly, Susan, who are desperately in need of people's compassion. Welcome to Austin Faith Dialogue, Susan. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. 
coming into your life and you coming into my life has been a real adventure and I thank you for making the initiative. Uh, I met you when you came and talked to me about signing a petition and I was so pleased to meet you at that time. I must admit that for many of us, we don't know a lot about what's happening in Iraq. Can you tell us, Susan, some of the things that are going on with the nation of Iraq and the children there? Sure, I'd like to. Uh, we find, in fact, that so many people in Austin and around this country know so little about what's going on in Iraq, uh, mainly because there just hasn't been a whole lot about it in our mainstream media. What do you have here to show me? Yeah, I want to show a picture of a, a young fellow by the name of Wissam. This young boy uh, died on the same day, later the same day that this photograph was taken in October of last year. He was six years old. He died of malnutrition in a hospital in Baghdad. I want to show right next to it a picture of my own nephew named Nathan, who still lives, age six. I think that the only difference between these young boys is that we saw him happen to live in the country of of Iraq where our government has a quarrel with their political leadership. I think that every young child really has the right to grow up and there is just a generation now of, of children in Iraq who aren't being given this right. Uh, even Susan, excuse me for interrupting, sure. but look, just look at me and talk with me about okay. this, okay? okay? I would like to know if you're with the Austin Coalition for International Justice. What, Susan, can people of the Austin community do? Iraq's a long way away. What can they do, Susan, to become involved in, in sharing compassion with the children that you've just shown us a picture of? Well, uh, what we'd like to do is ask people of faith uh, from their communities, their faith communities, to become more educated mm -hmm. about what's happening in Iraq. Uh, there is a fellow in Austin who many people know. His name is Alan Pogue. He's a very noted photojournalist. He traveled to Iraq. He's been there twice in this last year, and he's taken many wonderful photographs, and he's able to speak to different church groups. So one of the first things to do, you think, would be for people in the Austin community who are concerned about the situation in Iraq to become educated and to contact people like exactly. you and Alan and mm -hmm. have you come and share with their faith communities. That's right. Why is education so important? You know, to be honest, that whole experience of Desert Storm seems a, a long time ago for many of us. Lots has happened since then. Tell us how we can go about being educated. What should we know about the situation in Iraq? Well, uh, as I mentioned, we, we read very little about what's happening in Iraq in the mainstream media, so I think we need to learn about it from folks who have been there and witnessed uh, the conditions under which the Iraqi people are living. Mm -hmm. uh, when the war, just before the Persian Gulf War, economic sanctions were imposed upon that country, and since that time, even today, approximately 5,000 children a month are, are dying mm -hmm. uh, from malnutrition and preventable diseases, mainly due to uh, contaminated water. Mm -hmm. Because during the bombing, uh, sanitation systems, water treatment plants were bombed, and they haven't been able to be repaired because of the economic sanctions spare parts for that kind of facility are not allowed in under the sanctions policy. Susan, you're a Quaker. That's right. The Quakers are people who have been uh, committed to peace and justice. Tell us a little bit about what it means to be a Quaker. On Austin Faith Dialogue, we talk about our neighbor's faith, and your faith is important to us, particularly in this area of, of compassion for people and children of the world. Uh, what is the commitment of Quakers to the peace process? Well, thank you for asking. Uh, yes, the Quakers are considered one of the three traditional peace churches, <clears throat> along with the Mennonites and the Church of the Brethren. And uh, uh, as friends, we feel that there is that of God in every person, and that leads us to um, <clears throat> become conscientious objectors to war, for example. Mm -hmm. uh, many of us uh, are war tax resistors, for example. Uh, we, we 
We try to resist militarism in its many forms, especially in this country. Mm -hmm. You think that the Friends meeting in Austin is a part of this whole process of trying to be concerned about the children of Iraq. Does the Friends meeting support the Austin Coalition for International Justice, or how do you handle those types of issues? Is that something that is involved in your community? Yes, the, the Austin Friends meeting will often make a statement our business process when things happen. Uh, we tend to be very involved in what goes on politically in this country. We have a lobby group in Washington, D.C., for example, called the Friends Committee on National Legislation. And friends just tend to be f fairly outspoken uh, when it comes to, to our policies. For a group that is often quiet when you go to be with them, Mm -hmm. They can be outspoken then on issues that are concern for them in the area of compassion. That's right. I'm wondering also then if a second step for people of the Austin community who are concerned about the situation in Iraq would be the possibility of contacting their, their leadership. You mentioned education as one step. Another step then would be to contact leadership. Do you have suggestions in that area? Well, um Yes, we, we would ask people in congregations to perhaps talk to their pastor, ask if maybe the church on a national level has made a statement regarding the sanctions, and many churches have. Mm -hmm. The Methodist Church, the Church of Christ, uh, the Presbyterian Church, uh, many Catholic bishops, including our own uh, Bishop McCarthy, have, have spoken out and called for lifting the sanctions against Iraq. Mm -hmm. So it's helpful to involve one's uh, pastor. You know, I'm interested in your faith journey because I think it's important for our viewing audience of Austin Faith Dialogue to realize that a fellow citizen in this community is involved as you are involved. To get a petition signed, you went around and visited a group of clergy, and there will be other clergy who will be watching this program and interested in what you're doing. What did you find out, Susan, as you went around visiting the clergy of the community? Uh, did you come away with feelings of uh, negativism, or what did you find? Well, I do admire the work that the clergy persons are doing in, in Austin. I found uh, so many of them have, have very active churches and are, are very involved in the, in the life of their own religious community. So I certainly admire the work that, that clergy persons do. When you brought the petition around regarding the situation in Iraq, mm -hmm. you found a responsiveness on the part of the clergy of the Austin community to, to listen to you and then to uh, possibly respond and sign the petition, is that correct? I did. I found that most folks with whom I spoke really didn't know a lot uh, about what was happening, so I, f I was very happy to, to talk to folks. They were very willing to, to talk with me and to find out more. Uh, and to share that with their congregants. If you could uh, change the situation in Iraq from your compassion, your concern for people, your, your faith, seeing God in other people, how would you change the situation in Iraq and what would you like it to be, the best scenario that you can think of? Well, I certainly, first of all, I would call for lifting the sanctions and I would call for stopping the bombing. Many folks don't know that the U.S. continues to bomb Iraq, especially in the southern no-fly zone. And there are civilian casualties even today. And this, again, is something we're not reading about in the news. So I would call for lifting the sanctions, stopping the bombing immediately. And I think in order to really help the um, people of Iraq, organize for political change within their own country. We need to help them restore their systems of education, communication, and especially just basic social services. If the folks don't have enough food to eat and if they don't have adequate health care, they simply cannot organize themselves for, for organizing for political change there. Is it not true that uh, members of the UN and maybe uh, foreign uh, diplomats from around the world, others have called upon uh, lifting the sanctions? Yes, that's right. And many people within our, within our own country have done that too. But we would ask people at the local 
kind of grassroots level to speak out as well. Uh, letters to the editor of the paper are very important, especially because of so little being in the media about it. I find it exciting that Austin Faith Dialogue, this television program, is inviting the uh, national media to uh, mm -hmm. center themselves on this issue and to remind the population and the culture that there are these needs and that children are in need in Iraq for humanitarian compassionate concern. What other elements could the faith community do beside educating, contacting their representatives and their church leaders? Uh, it's impossible for them. Did you not, through your group, invite in some speakers to uh, help educate the community? That's right. That was really among the first things we did. Uh, we, we've invited several very uh, distinguished speakers to Austin to help educate Austinites about what is really happening in Iraq. These are people who've been to Iraq more than once and have direct personal experience about what the Iraqi people are facing. And when they come back, when those speakers came and spoke here in Austin, mm -hmm. what were they saying as you listened to them, Susan? What were they trying to tell you and others who were there? Well, one thing that stands out to me, uh, for me, was a common thread among all of them was how beautiful, dignified, and um, hospitable the Iraqi people were to them when they were there. I think the Iraqi people have a skill at um, being able to um, see people as individuals and not necessarily as representatives of what their government is doing. Mm -hmm. And they were able to, to welcome these obvious Westerners and share with them the little that they had, even if it was just tea. Um, and show hospitality. That's right. Mm -hmm. I know Ellen Pogue, our, our local photojournalist, who's been many places in the world, said of all the places he's been, the Iraqi people were the the warmest mm -hmm. and the most hospitable. We want to put up on the screen uh, the World Wide Web so that people can contact and get more ed Good. education and more information. Mm -hmm. But what has it meant to you to be a part of the Austin Coalition for International Justice? As that comes up on the screen and people can then, uh, there it is, the web address is there. T what has it meant for you, Susan, to be a part of all of this process? Well, it's been a very good experience working with different people from different faith backgrounds and, and some people f who come at it from more, uh, more of a um, humanitarian mm -hmm. aspect. And it's a form of compassion and that's what we want to invite you to through Austin Faith Dialogue to experience those elements of com compassion. Inner Faith Care Alliance is one of those. Or if you'd like to be a part of international justice, we invite you to share with Susan and others. May compassion be in your life always. Thanks for watching Austin Faith Dialogue, and have a good day.